I am so conservative. I rationalize in my head. These are things I read. And I'm going to talk about Willow Creek. Okay. Uh, Willow Creek, a few years back, had invited. I remember at the time when Will Rogers said, I, I don't belong to any organized religion. I'm a Baptist. Yeah. <laughs> I am so conservative. If you didn't jump to conclusions, you might not get any exercise. Welcome to the Unknown Webcast, and yes, it is true. I really am so conservative, I can't turn left even when I'm driving, uh, including being theologically conservative, by the way, and that means I want to know what is true, and I'm willing to have my ideas challenged. On the other hand, there may be viewers who have a fear of hearing an idea, which may lead them to actually thinking and testing their beliefs. So for them, this is a trigger warning. This is not a safe space for those who may be easily offended by having their ideas challenged. Today's August 11, 2020, and this is broadcast number 202. This is the first time our guest, Tom Gilson, joins us, and he may regret it before we're done, I'm certain. Uh, he's a senior editor with The Stream, author of several books, and today we'll be talking about his newest book, Too Good to be False. My name is Don Vino, and I'm president of Midwest Christian Outreach, Inc. in Wonder Lake, Illinois, which produces the Unknown Webcast. Uh, and our senior researcher is Ron Hensel. He's the uh, co-host, resident COVID-19 tracker, and will introduce the sponsors of today's webcast. And what did I misstate there, Ron? Uh I just said I'm still here. Uh, still can, here. Yeah, still I'm still, here. as of today, I'm still doing this. And, and we'll you double your salary. Oh, hey, I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, greetings from sunny Florida where the uh, sun, the, I'm sorry, where the palm trees came out, saw their shadows, and now they we have 12 more months of summer. Well, Our, all tw yes, 12. Our sponsors for this webcast include World's End Theology Outlet, your one-stop resource for half-baked heresies, dubious doctrines, and other ideas whose time has gone. World's End Theology Outlet and the Designer Jesus Collection. No longer need your church's Jesus be a source of social embarrassment. Visit one of the many Designer Jesus Collection runways at a church near you. And if you enjoy this webcast, or if it really annoys you you'd like to inflict it on somebody else. To ensure continued access, please go to midwestoutreach.org, click the yellow donate button, and contribute as you feel led. And don't forget to subscribe to us on YouTube. Greetings, Tom Gilson. Hello. Hello. So. And, and we have the book. Just uh, He has it behind his uh, little uh, head there. And his I have little head? My little head. <laughs> yeah. And uh, we also have it right here, just in case so everyone can make sure they see the whole thing. Too good to be false. How Jesus' incomparable character reveals his reality. Kind of uh, kind of an unusual idea there. Yeah. It, you sound like a, half, a glass half full kind of guy with a title like that. Uh, <laughs> instead of a glass half empty. Too good to be false. Um, Too good to be false. <laughs> So what sparked the idea uh, of, uh, of this kind of a book? Yeah, that's a good question. In, in one sense, I don't know. Uh, but it, it goes back years when I was blogging at thinkingchristian.net, which is my blog. I also write at the stream, stream.org. But uh, that's more recent. And you, know, you try to trace the, the, the genesis of an idea, and I, I have no idea how to do it. But the earliest trace of it was when somehow it occurred to me that Jesus was unique in ways that don't often get discussed. He's, uh, 
you, you look at all the, the really powerful characters in history or even in literature. And, and, and then, you know, you think of people like, you know, Genghis Khan, you think of people like um, uh, Stalin, you think of in, in uh, literature, you think of the mythological gods and so on. Think of all the power that they had. Jesus had way more power than even the mythological gods. And, and yet there's another group of people that for some reason came into my mind to compare, and that's all the, the really self-sacrificial, uh, other-oriented, giving, caring people. And, you know, I've asked people, who, who would you list on that list? And they, they usually say Mother Teresa, Billy Graham. My favorite one ever was Mom. And, and it occurred to me that those two lists are always separate lists. You don't get really powerful people who are also really, really good, caring people. Oh, and then there's an exception to that. There's a big exception to that, and it's Jesus. And, and that struck me. Jesus is, is, is more different than I'd realized. He's more different. He, he is in, in the sense that you know, people think you can make up a Jesus, and, and skeptics think that, that he was made up through a legend kind of a building process. Because, like, you know, that's an easy story to invent. Well, no one else ever has. No one else has ever invented a person who was as powerful as Jesus and as good as Jesus. So this, that started me on, on a path of some writing. had an article in Touchstone six years ago, Touchstone Magazine. And um, for a long time, it just stayed there. But then uh, a couple of years ago, a year and a half ago, maybe even, I started extending that to other aspects of the character of Jesus and discovering he is way more amazing than I realized. I've been a Christian for over 40 years. And during that time, I've always known that the doctrine says, and the doctrine is true, that Jesus is God. I've always known him as the resurrected God who could do miracles. But when I started looking deeper at his character, his goodness, his brilliance, his, I thought, he's more amazing than anybody ever probably can grasp, way more than I ever knew. And that's what was the seed of the book. Okay. So yeah. one of the things, and I, and I brought up, uh, I have at least part of your uh, chapter layout. You have... Uh, yeah. Uh, seeing Jesus through new eyes. Let me bring this up and folks can look at it. Uh, okay. Seeing Jesus through new eyes. That's uh, chapter one. And then you have part one, uh, mm -hmm. greater than you knew, which is what you were expounding on just yeah. briefly now. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so you have chapter two, Jesus astonishing love. Chapter three, Jesus suppressing brilliance. Four, Jesus authority. Five, Jesus paradoxical leadership. What does that one mean? That's kind of interesting. Yeah, the uh, in all of these things, what what we have. By the way, I almost named the book something like um, "We're too used to Jesus" because he surprises us. If you look at him from a different perspective, and the different perspective I took in this book, uh, I don't know of anybody else who's ever done this, and I'm hearing this from others. I didn't look at what Jesus did; I looked at what he didn't do. Um, and what he didn't do in leadership is he didn't lead the way that, that you're supposed to lead. I've got a degree in organizational psychology. I know something about leadership studies. Jesus did it wrong. Hmm. <laughs> Jesus did it wrong. He did. Yeah. And yet did he succeed? Well, you know, founding a movement that lasts for 2000 years and grows and grows and grows and reaches billions of people. That's not a bad start for a leader. Yeah. But let me tell you what he did wrong. He did some things right, obviously. I didn't, I'm not saying he did everything wrong. But do you want, imagine yourself working for a leader who never learns from his mistakes, who never asks you for your opinion, unless he wants to explain to you how it's wrong. Uh, who, when he interviews for the job, says, yeah, I have friends as long as they'll do what I, what, what I command them. Who, 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 for whom uh, it's his way or the highway every single time, who's never wrong, who wants to follow that leader? There's something 
unexpected about Jesus' character everywhere you look, if you're willing to look in these unexpected places. Have you ever, what you just uh, listed there does also sound like some of the traits of cult leaders. Yeah. Okay. So I just thought you, when you asked yeah. the question, who would want right. to follow somebody like that? I mean, I, well, I can think of a few thousand people who had just off the top of my head, some of them sure. committed suicide for right. this kind of yeah. way. So, so is there he something didn't end up that, with that kind of outcome? Yeah, go ahead, Don. No, yeah. is there something else that offset uh, his character that sort of said, "Okay, I, I yeah. really can live with all these things because of something else in his character"? Of course, uh, there is. Yes, of uh, course, there is. Well, I would say he was who he said he was. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's one thing for you to do and say all those things that you just mentioned. It's another thing to do them and say them and walk on water. And yeah. multiply loaves and fishes. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, you know, I, uh, we've had other people who have made similar claims to Jesus. How many of them have done the works, the miracles that Jesus did? None. Zero. So, right. And, yeah. and well, that, Jesus, you know, that obviously, you know, there's, there is one person who can uh, succeed without ever learning from his mistakes. And that's a person who never makes one. Right. Uh, it's, there's one person who doesn't need your advice. It's someone who already knows. And there's one person who, the, who can, who can attract people in spite of that. And it's the person whose love really is incredibly overwhelming. Yes. And so, you know, one of the, one, the message from this isn't obviously, isn't that bad, Jesus was a bad leader. Uh, you know, one message would be, don't try to do this the way he did. The, the the real message is that Jesus is more surprising and more uh, unexpected than we think. He, he, and he has, has and and there's, his, there's, yeah, go ahead. There's, there's, a, there's an element that you may touch on in, in the book. Yeah. But it comes, to, it leaps to my mind because Ron and I, particularly, we're a mission to cults and non Christian religions primarily. Yeah. Unfortunately, yeah. we have to deal with false teachers in the church, some of which are authoritarian and they would fit. A lot of the criteria that you kind of laid out, yeah. but they lack something that Jesus um, uh, modeled and told his friends. Okay, you could, yeah, if you do what I say, you're my friend. But he did something else as well. Mm -hmm. He said, "He who is great among you must be the servant of all." Yes. So he wasn't simply the boss leader; he did the ultimate serving. He was a servant. Yeah, we had to deal with this with Bill Gothard because he had was under the impression that because the Roman hierarchy chain of command from the top down was the higher you are in a position of leadership, the less accountable you are, because God becomes your uh, guide. You're accountable to Him. You're not really accountable to anybody else, and it works itself down. So you're mm -hmm. unconfrontational. You're not there really to serve. You're there to boss. Jesus did exactly the opposite. He inverted that whole thing. Right. He said, no, 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 no. You don't rule like, you know, these pagans rule. Mm -hmm. If you want to be a great leader, you have to serve everybody. Right. And that's, that's where Jesus stands different is that, you know, the, the rules for leadership, the, the, you know, the standards that that apply to normal leaders, like you need to, you know, get people's advice. You need to listen to them. A lot of that has to do with the fact that leaders, no, no leader has it all. And certainly no leader is the same kind of servant that Jesus was. Right. Um, we need each other. We desperately need each other. Jesus didn't come to us because he needs us. Right. He, he came to us strictly because he loves us he's he's so different in that way right right even yeah. his coming was serving those who really rightfully deserved being destroyed yeah yeah <laughs> hey, I, i'm actually mentioned this in my book that we think of when, when you think of people who sacrifice themselves you can think of um well, there was Socrates. Socrates uh, is the, the greatest number two example of someone who died for his beliefs in ancient, uh, in, in, in ancient times. And it's a very, 
very virtuous story of a man who just wouldn't back down from his beliefs and accepted the court's judgment and drank the hemlock and died. Uh, one thing about that is his death was completely painless. Right. Another thing about it that makes him different from Jesus, though, is that Socrates had to die eventually. Jesus didn't even didn't have die. to be born. Right. There's there's a a year or so ago, there was a guy in India who filed, I love this, he filed suit as, against his parents for wrongful birth. Oh. He filed suit. I, I have no idea how this came out. It's just a great story. I, you know, I, I've got the links to it. He filed suit against his parents for wrongful birth. And you, know, you get the, the sense that if he'd signed informed consent before it happened, he'd have been okay with that. Well, Jesus gave informed consent. No, no one else did. And he gave informed consent to the whole thing for right. us right? because he loves us. Right, right, yeah. right. And, you know, I, I love, I kind of love the way he, he taught and, and dealt with confrontation. Uh, the blog we're working on this week, I, we kind of are dealing with Luke 10. Uh, and, and I really liked it because, they, you know, this young attorney, you know, probably fresh out of Harvard or something. And the young attorney comes up yeah. and thinks, I, I've got a gotcha question, uh, mm -hmm. uh, 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 you know, about eternal life. And, and Jesus doesn't answer the question. He says, uh, you've read the law. What, what, what are the great, you know, what does it say? So he tells him, well, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. He says, okay, good. Go do that. Mm -hmm. That's that's it. Yeah. <laughs> and then he goes, okay, I got a loophole on this. Who's yeah. my neighbor? Mm -hmm. And so Jesus doesn't answer that. He just lays out this whole story about the most hated group that Jews could think of, the Samaritan. Right. And he says, Okay, who's the hero here? Who's the neighbor? Who's well, the guy who did mercy, <laughs> right? Bingo, go and do that. Uh, yeah, it's amazing, it's just amazing stuff. He does, yeah. Um, that's another thing Jesus never did is he never walked away from one of those encounters going, could have said that better. <laughs> have you? I mean, is there anybody else in uh, history who time. has gotten it right? with every different individual yeah. and he wow. he did yeah and and you, you look at jesus and you think of his parables and they're so simple and so homely and you think yeah okay anybody could do that no no the part where he gets it right every time that's a little bit unusual no that's that's completely unique that's completely yeah. unique that is yeah. very completely unique uh <laughs> Okay, so let's do uh, another look. See at uh, at our uh, chapters. Okay. Uh, uh, world changing mission: the man who was God, Jesus' friend, and then you have interlude, part one, conclusion: the total supremacy of Jesus. What are you doing in there? That's a summary of part one, and it's a, an, an introduction to part two. It's just, so it's it's hinging between the two. Um, so it's a little hard to talk about it on its own, but basically it's saying Jesus is so good. But but actually there's a question in there, which is, okay, it's a good story, but is it true? Uh -huh. And part two is about answering a question, is it true and how do we know? And it answers it in a way, and I've, um, I, I actually saw Josh McDowell several months ago and um, we've worked together. I know Josh and um, great, you know, one of the greatest living apologists. And I said, Josh, I've got a, a, a book coming out with an apologetics argument that you've never seen. And he looked at me and he said, I've seen a lot. And I said, I know it's a bold claim. And he said, you owe me a book, Tom. And I said, no, I owe you a lot more than that, Josh, which is true. But um, cause uh, I owe, him an awful lot. But this actually is a new argument for our generation. This is a new way of explaining how we know the Gospels are true. It has not been written since the 1920s, at least, and um, not written in length uh, since even before then. Uh, it, and, and the reviewers who look at what I wrote there are saying, yeah, this is, this is actually holding up. This is a new 
new way of looking at Jesus uh, and and his historicity. So you're you're you. It sounds like you're basically arguing the title. Yes. Because, uh, there, nobody who's this good could be false. Could have That's not right. existed. That's right. How, that how is the, this, the argument. How does this yeah. differ from the uh, ontological argument for the existence of God? You know. Well, yeah. Some people have compared it to that, and uh, I have to warn viewers that I've had several people, including. Uh, Jeff Myers of Summit Ministries, who said, yeah, I heard that. And I thought, nah, I, I'm, I've got objections already that I know of from skeptics. And Jeff, he actually endorsed the book. He said, when I read the book, I found out, yeah, this actually is a good argument. So if you're thinking objections because of other versions of something like this that you've heard, this one is actually, it really is different. So I need it's to- It's different from the ontological argument. Uh, because the analogical argument basically says, you know, uh, imagine the most perfect being. Mm -hmm. And if you can imagine the most perfect being, then he must exist or he wouldn't be perfect. That's right. which some people say, well, that's a circular argument. Uh, uh -huh. That's usually the criticism. Now, on the other hand, when it comes to Jesus, we're not just imagining a person. Right. We are dealing with an historical figure. Right. Uh, and so really, there's. it sounds like there has to be another component to there the is. argument other than just he's so there great is. he must have really existed. And that is, well, he must have really existed because so many people who knew him personally and could find no fl flaw with him. They could find no sin in him. They mm -hmm. could, I mean, you know, you have the, uh, the one of the closest apostles to him, John, who was who would say you know he's like us he's without sin, yeah. Uh, and so, uh, so in other words, they're basically we, we have eyewitness testimonies mm -hmm. to the fact that he is as good as you say he is. Right, but that's actually not the argument. This one's different. It's, well, yeah. yeah. Um, oh, well, so if that's it's not even a component of the argument. It's not even there. There is that is part of it. Okay. Yeah. So but here's yeah. Go ahead. Well, what, can you summarize it better yeah. than I summarized it then? Oh yeah. So what I did with this is I took the story seriously as a story. The you know, the one thing we can agree on for sure with skeptics is that the story of Jesus is a story. It's it's in four different versions. You know what, Tom? I, I want you to hold your thought right there okay. because we want to do this. But before we do this, we need to point out that oftentimes, and these arguments are important because oftentimes even those who are operating within the church uh, try to stay away from doctrine. I mean, they're so busy trying to increase yeah. their numbers, bring in more money, that they really kind of downplay the whole thing of doctrine. And one of our sponsors uh, has a product to address that exact issue. Yeah, Worlds on Theology Outlet has a question, or maybe more than one. Are you still trying to figure out how to clean up in the ministry business? Uh, do you, uh, excuse me, <laughs> come on, you're supposed, do you want to finally learn how to get to the bottom of growing a successful church? Would you like to flush away your failures and start having your best church now? Well, then you need charlatan ultra soft because nothing says theologically soft like Joel Osteen's charlatan ultra soft. And even in these days of COVID-19 pandemics, you will never see a shortage of charlatan ultra soft. It's personally tested by the man himself. It provides comfort where it counts. It wipes away even the most stubborn orthodoxy and comes with a money back guarantee. Keep those butts in the pews with Charlatan Ultrasoft, available only at World's End Theology Outlet. So there you go. Make sure there you do you that. <laughs> okay. Well, that was glorious. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, from, okay. from that yeah. to whack I, eloquent. <laughs> yeah, right. So I take the story seriously as a story. The, the thing is, uh, stories always come from somewhere. Stories always have a backstory to explain where the story comes from. The skeptics have their backstory for where Jesus' story came from. Of course, we Christians have a different backstory. And a, and a backstory has to fit the story. If you tell the story of... Um, in the book, I talk about a um, 
you know, you know, a concert pianist who told his brother-in-law that this novel on the shelf was the perfect, perfect description of life on the road as a classical musician, feeling the piano under your fingers and the, and the glorious music. You open it up and the fly leaf says it was written by a professional hockey player from Calgary and his business manager. You go, there's a mismatch there and, and, and you know something's wrong. Right. You have it has to fit. So the question is whose backstory fits? The Christian backstory certainly fits because we say that the story is true. And if the story is true, then the story itself makes sense within the context of it being true. They say the story is false. Okay, where did it come from? What's the story behind the story? And in order for it to fit, it has to explain the multiple perfections of Jesus. And those are in the first seven chapters in, uh, in, in, in laid out in all kinds of ways in part one of the book. It has to fit the multiple perfections of Jesus. Well, what is their backstory? Uh, they don't all say the same thing, but it typically it starts with a Jesus who really lived and, and gathered followers. You know, it's perfectly fully human. Gathered followers, they got all excited about him, but he died. And he was, you know, he was crucified and he was gone. They were devastated. They had to find some way to recover their psychological well-being. This is a common actual um, uh, experience in, the, in philosophy, psychology, I'm sorry. Uh, and they treat it under a heading called cognitive dissonance reduction. And, and sometimes people, when they're just devastated by a loss of something they put all their heart into, they will find a way to make it true after all. And the disciples did that. They made it true after all by inventing a resurrected Jesus. So they now, started with that. Uh, and the can, story you help, can you hold that a second? Where they start sure. with that? Because uh, yeah. I just want to confirm what you're saying. Uh, yeah. In the 1950s, there was a UFO cult uh, that yeah. had predicted the end. They were going to be picked up and all of that. And it didn't happen. Uh, and so a, a researcher got the idea. They said, uh, this is interesting. They are now not disappointed. They have sort of redoubled their efforts to believe. Right. Uh, they actually planted a when prophecy failed. Right. Yeah. yeah. They, they actually had a member of their team in that group leading up to that time so they could observe it. Right. Uh, right. Leon Festinger is ahead of it, and it's called When Prophecy Fails. When Prophecy Fails, right. It, I read it as an undergrad. I just love the book. So interesting. Yeah. So that does happen. And, right. they, and so the skeptics say that's how the Jesus thing started. But it's spread because part of it is you redouble your efforts to convince people. And so they spread it around you know, uh, Judea and into up into Syria, uh, eventually Asia Minor, Europe, and even North Africa got in the picture. And it spread and it spread. And Bart Ehrman, who's the number one skeptic uh, talking about this, this story about how the Jesus legend developed, he says, in I think at least four of his books, he talks about the telephone game where you pass a story from one person to the next and to the next. It's all uh, transmitted orally. And he says, what happens to the stories? They change. Well, yeah, but that's too, too light a word for it. They're, they're going every which way. They're going to the four winds practically. And stories under that kind of circumstance are not just going to change. They're going to get distorted badly. They're going to get corrupted. And, and somehow, somehow they all came back to four landing points, four landing points, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And somehow all of these different, you know, through the, through the, yeah, and by the way, they, they all had their own theological or political uh, emphases that they wanted to put into their versions that they wrote down. And yet the character of Jesus comes out perfect in all of them and identical. How does that backstory fit the story? The backstory is the story of a story scrambler. And... You know, atheists will say, well, you know, the, the Gospels disagree on the number of angels at the tomb. See, it's scrambled. Um, okay, that's looking at the twigs. You're missing the forest. The forest is the character of Jesus. And in multiple ways, he gets everything right, 
or the authors get everything right four times without ever missing a beat. That doesn't fit the legend backstory that the uh, skeptics propose. Their story backstory has to be wrong. Hmm. Yes, and and they also miss something else when they look at the okay. twigs like that. Yeah. Uh, uh, they they have a, they suffer a math problem at that point uh, because in one place it says there's two angels, in another place it says there's one angels. Yeah. And as uh, the late Dr. Norm Geister points out, it mathematically happens every time. Wherever there's two angels, there's always one angel. Right. Mm -hmm. right. No text says there was only one angel. Mm -hmm. uh, it was fixated on one. And in fact, uh, Bart Ehrman, we had him uh, debate at one of our conferences. Uh, and uh, afterwards, I, I did an article. I had to do an article because he was making claims that just are wrong. Yeah. Uh, and, and he says, you know, what you need to do is not to read each of the Gospels beginning to end, but you need to read them across, and then you'll see all of the errors. And so I did that and then demonstrated that even if you read them across, they all still line up where you're pointing out. Right. Uh, and uh, so we did an article called Interrupting Airmen to deal with those claims. Because he's yeah. just wrong. <laughs> he's just wrong. But there's another layer of this that doesn't get discussed often enough, or as to my knowledge, some of this never has. And that is the things that aren't in the Gospels that you would expect if they were somehow distorted or corrupted. For example, every single prophet says, thus says the Lord. How often does Jesus say, thus says the Lord? <laughs> Once. He's speaking. Yes. He's speaking as if these are the words of God, but he's not quoting God. Right. He's speaking as God. Uh, nor is he yeah. quoting any other rabbi, which was common. He is not. If you looked at the footnotes, if he, if he had put footnotes under the Sermon on the Mount, it would have said, source, Jesus of Nazareth, source, Jesus of Nazareth, source, me. Now, that's not something that's normal. In, in the, the, the Talmud, which was begun to be formed around that time, the, you know, they quote rabbi after rabbi after rabbi after rabbi. That's normal. For Jesus just to speak on his own, that's not normal. But every single gospel has him speaking on his own. One of them, if there were a story scrambler, one of them would have said, had him saying, ah, thus says the Lord. Or as Rabbi Shammai said, something like that. Right, right. Well, and and, yeah, and, right. and, and exactly. on, on, on some occasions, he went so far as to override the previously written word of God. You have heard it say, and he alludes to something that God said in the Old Testament, but I say, <laughs> yeah, he, 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 right. Well, he actually says that it's six times in the Sermon on the Mount. Um, uh -huh. right. I, my view is, is that he's given the correct interpretation as opposed to. I agree. Yeah, with, sure. with the misinterpretation. Uh, but yeah, he's he is um, no other rabbi. In fact, no other person ever spoke that way. No. In, in ancient he's times. His own authority. Yeah. It, it, yeah. Yeah. Oh, and, and I was, while we're on the Sermon on the Mount, um, picture this in your church. You've, you've got yourself a, a guest speaker. Maybe he's candidating to be your new pastor. He gets up on the platform and, and he says a few nice words of, you know, warm greeting and feel good stuff. And then he says, um, you don't have to worry. I'm not here to abolish the Bible. Right, right, right. right. <laughs> it's like, where did that come from? You know? I, who says that? That's like right. a guy standing at the base of the Rockies with a pickaxe well, saying, don't worry, I'm not going to chop the whole thing down. I, I preached on that just a few <laughs> weeks ago, and I made that exact point. It's, really? Cool. Yeah, I did. I made that exact point. It was like, um, <laughs> you know, who talks this way? Uh, who, you know, if 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 you if I got up here and said, you know, I, I literally use that as an illustration. You know, if I were to come up here to this pulpit and say, I do not think that I have come Let's just, I use an example. Do, do not think that I've come to abolish the church constitution of this, or the, or, the, or the doctrinal statement of this church. I have not come to abolish it, but to fulfill it. You would think, well, what's, what's with this guy? What, why, did, why would he think we, he has the authority to do that? Well, yeah. that, we, that we would give him any such authority to do that, you know? Well, why did it but even come it's, up? It's, it's, it's the kind of a statement that assumes that you might have the authority to do that. 
Right. You, you know, right. Yeah. Yeah. The, another one, since you since you're in cult ministry, this actually came out of a I had me, a series of meetings with a would be cult leader. His uh, his son had expressed some interest in Christ. Son was 20 something year old. And, and we were going to get together, the son and I. Um, and I did not know the dad was coming too, but he came and it turned out he was he was had everything for a cult leader except for followers. He only had five <laughs> followers. But he was he was wrong in a lot of his theology. But the one thing that stuck out to me is he kept saying, my father says to me, speaking to God, my father says to me this. And it sounds very devotional and worshipful, but something about it bothered me. So I went home and I researched it and I came back to him and I said, you, you keep talking about my father. My father said, who, who says that in the Bible? And he said, the disciples. No. Nope. No. Not once. Jesus only. And right. he was so careful that after his resurrection in uh, in the book of John, he says, he tells, I think it's Mary, to go to the disciples and tell them that I go to my father and your father, to my God and your God. He did not put himself, he, he did not put his relationship with the father in any kind of a common category with anybody else's. Right relationship with the father that's different he yeah. never said our father except when he told them to right it was always my father yeah or and, and in father. fact that was one of the reasons that they wanted to stone him in john 10 mm -hmm. uh, my, you know my father works hitherto so also i work then they picked up stones again to stone him yeah. and he says for, uh, I, for many good works have i done well for which of them are you stoning me now and he, they said we're not stoning you for a good work, but for blasphemy, because you being a man, make yourself God. Right. Yeah. Yeah. He, he, he let himself get in trouble for it. Mm -hmm. So this is the kind of thing where um, in multiple ways, so just a couple examples where if, if the story had gone through a scrambler, like the skeptics propose. Right. It should have come out looking scrambled in Jesus' character. And and there are you know, a dozen ways in which mistakes should have crept in. Culturally expected mistakes, like saying, thus says the Lord or uh, Rabbi Shimon or whatever. And it never happens. The story, the character especially of Jesus is integrated, complete, perfect, amazing, unexpected, and completely consistent. It's not scrambled. And that's the, the core of the argument, is that now, the atheist for, version... For those who are interested, we have, they have a link in their description below. See, I'm, I'm actually getting... In, in YouTube? Below. Or, in, 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 a, in YouTube, in our description in YouTube. YouTube. Uh, they can click on that and uh, go to our uh, friendly neighborhood MCOI bookstore and uh, order the book. Uh, and uh, so mm -hmm. you'll get it there. A uh, skeptical challenge. Now, we're kind of talking about that right now. The skeptical right. challenge, the impossible legend. How do you invent the story of a God-man? You're kind of describing all of that right now as we're talking about this. Yeah, I am. The As I've presented early versions of this and or, or condensed versions of this argument, uh, you, I want to anticipate challenges. Uh, the one that I have heard most often is, oh, Jesus wasn't that good. Uh, he didn't outlaw, uh, he, he didn't condemn slavery. He did not say that gays are should be married. That's a common one. Jesus messed up because he didn't approve gay marriage. Um, he didn't elevate the status of women and those kinds of things. Uh, the, the worst one is he didn't condemn slavery. He did, uh, he, he did uh, teach the golden rule, which kind of covers it. But... Um, that's, there's one, uh, there, there's all kinds of ways. And I actually wrote another book called Critical Conversations on the Homosexuality Question. There are ways to answer those questions in, in, in great, you know, um, to, to really settle the issue. But there's another way to answer it for the purposes of this discussion, which is, let's just set aside those three or four or five questions that bother you about Jesus. Let's just look about look at the fact that he is the only 
perfectly powerful, perfectly self-sacrificial person ever in all history or literature. That stands out. Where did it come from? And if you say, yeah, but what about slavery? That's like the guy standing on the beach who finds a four carat diamond, picks it up and says, yeah, but look at all the sand. <laughs> uh, yeah. you, you still got to deal with what's there. Even if you're not sure about the rest, let's, let's deal with this one. And, and I, I think they, they're, I think they need to do. I think there's something there that needs dealing with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I do too. But, and it also, see, this goes back to a, a different kind of a problem, mm -hmm. which is Ron and I talk about this pretty frequently. Yeah. I, I, I contend that most people, their knowledge of history goes back about 18 minutes. I mean, they just have no understanding yeah. or grasp of what happened in history, especially if you get to 2,000 years ago. Jesus was a rabbi. And so mm -hmm. if you want to know what a Orthodox Jewish rabbi believed on those issues, that would include Jesus, all you have to do is go back and say, okay, what did the rabbis teach? Right. They taught something called the Mosaic Law. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we do know what they thought on homosexuality and uh, slavery and all of those things. Why? Because they were communicated in the Tanakh. They were communicated in the Old Testament law. Mm -hmm. Clarified, laid out. Here's what you can do. Here's what you cannot do. Here's the penalties for a whole variety of things. And so something that is already common knowledge, you don't necessarily have to speak directly to unless you're asked a question about it. Right. No one asked a question because they knew what the teaching was. Right. Right. And on slavery... Um if Jesus had condemned slavery, his mission would have turned into a different kind of mission than the one he intended it to be. It would have right. been political and economic. Right. And, um, oh, the, the funnier one, I've heard this two or three times. Why didn't Jesus teach people about germ theory and the importance of washing their hands? Think of how much misery that could have prevented. And I say, think of the priesthood that would develop around that. Think of the superstition. Think of how that would have screwed up his real purpose there. They wouldn't have known what, what you know. It would have been a religion. Well, you, you know, even yeah. if it even if it had not gone that direction, it's it, it's interesting that you, 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 it gets back to his purpose. Why did he come here? I came to seek and save those who were lost. You know, right. he didn't. He could have also simply miraculously healed everyone. Right. He could have yeah. simply done that. So you know. So when somebody, if somebody were to ask me, why didn't he teach germ theory? Well, okay. It sounds like you're assuming that he was going to go away at some okay. point and leave us to ourselves. Why do you think he was going to go away? Yeah. Do you know why? Do you know? Do you know the purpose of that? There was a purpose. It wasn't just it wasn't just so that you know we we could it would force us to have faith, but you, you, according to the scriptures, there was a purpose in his ascension, in his being seated at the right hand and sending the Holy Spirit. It was right. all for the same purpose. It all contributes to salvation ultimately. Yeah. So he could have simply dispensed with germ theory completely and gone on a healing mission around the world. He could have wiped out, he could have snapped his fingers and wiped out every disease <laughs> known to man. But he did But he didn't. He didn't. Yeah. Right. And thank God. You know, I, I look at, in Mark 2, we've got the, this is, this is one that, that's a, a, a Mark, a Mark inversion of, of how we know Jesus was God, where they dropped the, the paralytic through the uh, roof, and Jesus says to them, son, your sins are forgiven. Right. That's something only God can do, and, and that was that's the frequent discussion. But one of the other questions is, the guy was paralyzed. How come you didn't take care of him on that? You know, well, he did, but he did the forgiveness first. But I can okay. speak to that, too, Yeah. which is, I've... Um, more than half of my adult life, I have been um, at least partially lamed. I've had six major foot surgeries mm. with very long uh, recovery times. I have worn out three knee walkers and six 
orthopedic fracture boots. Mm. Wow. Um, I know what it means to, to be suffer. healed from that through yeah. medical. I know what it means to be able to walk. I know what it means to be forgiven and being forgiven is way better. Right. So uh, way you know, better. if I could dig just a little deeper, where yeah. do these questions come from? Where does the question about, you know, germ theory, if you know, come from, it comes from the desire to make earth like heaven. Yeah. Right. right. It, and, and it's, and why is, so now we got to ask, well, why isn't earth like heaven? And why didn't Jesus make earth like heaven? Well, the reason is, is because of sin Sin is the bigger problem than yes. the fact that Earth is not. In fact, Earth right. would be a paradise if it weren't for sin. If right. Jesus were to make a paradise out of Earth without first dealing with sin, then mm -hmm. God's holiness would go out the window. Right. right. And because sin is the problem, forgiveness is, you know, sin is the biggest problem by miles. Forgiveness is the better answer. It is. It's the now, starting point. The rest can follow. The rest matters. I, I am glad I can walk. I really am. But, uh, you know, given a choice, give me forgiveness. Yeah. Well, and Penn Jamin says also these things presume he didn't do this or that, whatever they're asking about. We don't know all he did, and we know that he did more than we know, right? Well, that's what the yeah, that's what yeah. the verses in the Gospel of John, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. <clears throat> exactly. So, so you're asking a question that you're assuming he didn't speak to these issues. We don't even know well, that. Well, one thing we do know is that he didn't heal everybody. We, we do, do know, know that. that. Uh, and, and he didn't. He did not cast all disease off the face of the earth. He did not make Earth back into a paradise overnight. And the reason he didn't is because sin, you know, sin still needs to be. Sin was dealt with on the cross. Yeah. But. It's still the, the the outworking of that salvation still needs to go out into all the world through the gospel, mm -hmm. and only when he returns will there be anything like a restoration of paradise that was lost right be before. Yeah, you know, yeah. I, I like this idea of looking at the character of Jesus to answer this question, because. So many groups want to create a Jesus after their own fashion that kind of reflects what they think. Yeah, it kind Jesus of should have been. right into that, doesn't it? Yeah, it, it kind of does dovetail right into that. And so they design their own Jesus. Yeah, and so and so this kind of brings up a, a question, and that is, uh, do you cringe when the Christians you hang out with try to introduce Jesus to your non-Christian friends? Well, you can say goodbye to the days when your church's Jesus was a source of social embarrassment. Now even your church can keep pace with the latest fashion-forward trends in spirituality. Introducing the Designer Jesus Collection. These amazing new Jesus styles are hitting church runways in the most exclusive Jesus fashion shows at churches near you. You don't want to miss Yoga Jesus, Hipster Jesus, Buddy Jesus, Socialist Jesus, Mormon Jesus, and of course, Muslim Jesus. At Designer Jesus Collection Fashion Shows, you will find a Jesus you'll be proud to introduce to your most sophisticated, cutting-edge friends and acquaintances. Please observe the attendance requirements, cost of admission, your eternal soul, required attire, semi-formal, all proceeds, benefit His Royal Majesty of the Kingdom of Darkness. The Designer Jesus Collection. London, Paris, Rome, New York, Salt Lake City, and coming to a church runway near you. So, don't want to miss it. <laughs> Socialist Jesus is pretty popular these days. No I think kidding. he's. I think he's the main Jesus right now. Yeah. 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 So, as you look at the character of Jesus, speaking of socialist Jesus, uh, do you have any comments on that in your book? Kind of talking about did he deal with economic uh, I, uh, issues? Was he concerned about? Uh, you know, uh, oppression of white people over every other group. How did he kind of line up on those things? Yeah. Um, I write for the stream, stream.org, which, by the way, is I would call the go-to place for a Christian perspective on current and, events. And, and we have a link to that down in the description box. Yeah. <laughs> we, 
we do that there. We kind of do that work there. And this, this, in this book, I didn't, I didn't, except for to answer the questions that I mentioned earlier about homosexuality and, and slavery. You know, in terms of economics, though, for example, and slavery in particular, it is a fact that, you know, even though we have real clear examples of people getting this very wrong, um, if you want to find a place where slavery is, you can find it everywhere. If you find want to find a place where slavery isn't, you have to go to a place where Christianity has been powerfully influential. Right. Um, Jesus had that effect, even if he didn't um, do it the way that, uh, you know, sign a piece of paper and say no more slavery. Uh, yeah, that's, you know, that's, that is important because as we look at the character of Jesus, he, he focused on serving the Father mm -hmm. and he focused on serving others. Everything yeah. about him was try to outserve everybody else. Yeah. Uh, right. And so when when you do that, then these kinds of questions sort of become non-questions. Why? Because it doesn't really matter what position somebody else is in in life. You're serving them. You right. could be the CEO of a corporation, but when you get into the body of Christ, you might be serving the janitor uh, at, at some event or gathering or whatever, right. because no one is greater than anyone else. Right. Uh, and so these kind of questions just don't really factor into our question. Right. Uh, yeah. And they're important questions. I just didn't cover them in this book. It's just a you know, different carved out topic area. Hmm. Sure. Well, you, you'd end up having a, a, a almost an encyclopedia if you try to answer every question. Uh-huh. <laughs> 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 so, uh, I invent the stories. Okay, we have one more, uh, one more little section here that we can try to cover. Yeah, uh, and that, that is part three. We'll do a little screen share here again. Okay, and uh, which is uh, how Jesus became so easy to take for granted. That's an interesting one. Mm -hmm. Jesus alone, faith alone. Jesus, no matter what. Uh, and then you have an epilogue for teachers pastors and other ministers so yeah. how did jesus become so easy to take for granted that is an intriguing question yeah uh by the way not to take this for granted too i want to make sure people know there's a study guide at the end for groups this is designed Good. you know uh, this is a very readable book in fact gary habermas said it was a very fun book although that might be because he really loves michigan state football and i have <laughs> one more story from there and that in there but um how did Jesus become easy to take for granted? It's just a little historical survey of the um, histor of the intellectual trends starting in the 1800s, perhaps maybe even sooner, where um, the the world started turning towards a naturalist, materialist, in other words, non supernatural uh, set of presumptions. Uh, Darwinism kicked in on that. Even World War One uh, contributed to it because before that. The, uh, the, the Christian nations thought they were superior. And after they were all trying to kill each other, that was hard for them to maintain as a fiction in their own minds. Uh, and what it, what, it, what it really is, is a, a history of something that you could also call a history of theological liberalism. And, and it opened the door for designer Jesus, really. Mm -hmm. and, and you can make Jesus what you want him to be, and then you can take him for granted. He's, he's, he becomes safe. Uh, he's he right. becomes you know, innocuous, right. and and he's not safe. No, Aslan is not a safe lion. That's no. right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so that's what that's about in there. Yeah. All right, Jesus uh, alone, faith alone. Yeah. Um, first, Jesus alone. We get in all kinds of trouble, don't we, for saying it's only Jesus? You know, we're not pluralistic. We're not tolerant. We're not good people. Here's the problem that I have, even with them saying that, it shows that they don't understand. If, if they're gonna put Christianity on a list of religions, well, it doesn't belong on a list. Either it's alone or it doesn't belong on the list at all. And the reason is the cross. 
the cross of Jesus, if it's on a list, becomes optional. God didn't. God could have done it another way, and maybe he did, too. Maybe maybe God had two ways. Maybe God has two, two or three ways to come to him. Maybe the universe has four or five nice ideas so we can get to whatever we want to get to. And one of those nice ideas is the brutal torture and execution of the Son of God. No. This is not a nice idea. This The cross is not a nice idea. I'm willing to say it's not even a good idea unless it's the only good idea. It has to be alone. And, and my goodness, if the cross isn't the only way to God, then the cross was awful. It was awful. Yeah. But, it's, but it's good because it's the way you know, Jesus did it for the joy set before him, it says in Hebrews 12, because it was the way that we can be reconciled to God. If there'd been a plan B, plan A wouldn't have been. So we have to be exclusivist. And people who say that we should put Christianity on a list, I say, take your list and take us off. <laughs> you know, uh, I, the, the problem with, quote, ex, uh, those who want to deny exclusive truth claims make an exclusive truth claim about it, number one, and they don't yeah. think it all the way through. You know, I got married back in a day when it was till death do you part. Well, in mm -hmm. fact, next month, Joy and I will be married 50 years. And wow. if you can imagine, she's put up with me all of that time. Now she's decided mm -hmm. she has to keep me because it would be too hard to train somebody new. But yeah. uh, one, one of the things that, that happened, and, and Dr. Norman Geisler, late Norm Geisler, uh, raised this because uh, it happened at his wedding as well. Uh, both of us made an exclusive statement about our relationship that we would be exclusive to our wives and separate from all other women. Mm -hmm. And, you know, nobody thought that was a wrong thing. They agreed you, with that. You're being so narrow and exclusive. I, I am absolutely narrow and exclusive. And my wife is as well. Till death do you part. Narrow and exclusive. Nobody thought it was a bad thing. Uh, and so they're not even thinking this through no, when you yeah. make these kinds of, it's gibberish. It's just, it's silly. It is, yeah. You know, when but, you said yeah. if the cross isn't the only idea, then it's a bad idea. You, you know, I, I was reading, it reminds me that I was reading Sinclair Ferguson the other day, and he, he mentioned something that really I had thought about practically since I was first a Christian, and that is, I just didn't put it the way he did. He, he, he was commenting on the Sermon on the Mount, the law, and he says, it's not by looking at the law that we see how bad sin is. We do see how we do see a partial view of how terrible it is, but it's by looking at the cross that we see how bad sin is. Uh, sometimes comedians say things that uh, offend Christians they're, when they do their co comic acts, and you might even say there might be a little bit more than inappropriate, maybe even blasphemous, and yet, interestingly, they have a point. One comedian, a female comedian, once said, I feel so guilty when I hear that Jesus died for my sins. I mean, why couldn't he have just broken a toenail or something? Uh, and so it's like, that's like, I cringe. I go, eh, like that. But notice where it starts. I, I feel guilty when right. I hear that Jesus died for my sins. Well, yeah. That's in other, in <laughs> yeah. other words, in other words, it's 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 interesting because you don't believe it you don't experience it as something that takes away your guilt right you think of it as something properly that shows your guilt yeah well and and i have a great quote uh, a video of uh bishop john shelby spong episcopalian bishop part of the jesus seminar saying you know why couldn't god just say i forgive you well he doesn't realize the gravity of sin which is brings us back to tom's point yeah. if the cross isn't the uh, uh, say, say that again if it's if it's not the only good. way to god it's yeah. it's not a good way basically right. spong is just repeating what the heretic Socinius said in the 17th century you know uh it was a, one of the exact arguments of the Socinians. god does not need a cross to forgive so, you know, he's nothing new under the sun there. There's not. 
So, yeah. all right, we're, we're going to be running a couple of minutes over, which we always do anyway, and I had warned you that that might happen. Yeah. Uh, Jesus, Jesus, no matter what. Yeah. You know, that's that's the, the last um, chapter before we get to the epilogue and so on. And it's the... It's kind of like the arrows all point there. We are, in every age and in every family, every Christian faces some really hard stuff. And you have to decide whether you're going to follow Jesus through it. We are entering an age, and we're moving well into it now, when for Western Christianity, for the first time, it's not just life is hard, but it's life is hard because you're following Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. And that takes it on a different level. And you know, the, the whole point of this book up to this up to here now has been Jesus is extraordinary. Yeah. He's amazing. He's way beyond great. He, he is he is I, I had to really back off on overusing these superlative words because it would have been too much. But oh, I could go on. I won't. <laughs> he is good enough to follow. He really is. He's good enough to follow. And, and and that's the first part of the book. The second part is, and it's true. And so the point of it all is we're moving into an age where we might have to be asked, are you going to follow Jesus? And the answer is, I'm going to follow Jesus no matter what. Okay. Because he's so good. In, and he's in, the in the description below, there's a link to uh, the book. There's a link to Tom's uh, uh, stream. You can uh, go and see what else he writes. Uh, now, you have an, uh, a wrap-up here, epilogue for pastors, teachers, and other ministers. And as he pointed out, you have a, a, a workbook to go along with this for small groups or whatever. Mm -hmm. So and what would you say to pastors, uh, just briefly, why they should get this book? You know, pastors, you want to get the book because it's a great way for your church to get a different view of Jesus, a, a closer view. What even J.P. Moreland uh, said really enlivened his worship, his, his understanding of Jesus. And, and so it's a great connection with Jesus. You've got a study guide in there. And not only that, but uh, to, to sum up the the epilogue in in one sentence, the the Bible says that in this day you need to be teaching that Jesus is good and Jesus is true. If you want to know where the Bible says, read the epilogue. Sorry, out of no, that's, <laughs> <laughs> I like it. That's a good way to do it. And with that, Ron, would you march us out of here? Yes, let's give credit where credit is due. Our resident cult leader profiler is Neil before me. Our wardrobe manager is See How It Fits You. Our culinary services come from Chef Ham and Cheese. Our tinfoil hat provis provisioner is Just In Case. Jehovah's Witnesses coverage comes from Armageddon and D Opposer. Our Mormon archives manager is Polly Gummus. Our liberal denominations bureau chief is Lucy Goosey. Transgender issues coverage comes from Ben Hur, our special correspondent for cults based on the Hindenburg disaster and flying Turkeys, oh, dehumanity, our fact-checking supervisor is Yoleg Pulling. Mer uh, technical assistance comes through Murky Research. Our legal advisors are at the law firm of Dewey, Cheatham, and Howe. Our grievance resolution director is Yovana Pisami. Our director of privacy assurance is YR Tapping. And original idea sourcing comes from Drew A. Blank. The Unknown Webcast is a production of Midwest Christian Outreach, Inc. in cooperation with Emergency Manicure Productions, both of whom are solely responsible for this content, but you will never be able to prove that in a court of law <laughs> will never happen well, so never never happen not even uh, once tom we're, we're really glad you thank you uh, to have had you and uh, now you, you know? can say you know you've been had <laughs> <laughs> and thanks for having me to, yeah, and, well. and to everybody else we will see you all next week say, say goodbye, vista, tom. Baby. goodbye tom <laughs>